This is Brew Crime. I'm Mike. And I'm Beck. And we've got a special guest today. Nina. Yay. Yay. Perfect. So today's theme is workplace crimes. Who hasn't had a bad day at work before? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a fitting theme to have our first guest. As Nina and I are friends from work. Oh, yep. perfect. Mm-hmm. So now you know what to look out for. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Or other people should look up for us. That's true. Yeah, totally. Yep. All right. What is your story about today, Beck? Uh, a nice Monday morning chat around the water cooler ends in death, as if Monday mornings weren't bad enough. This is an episode I'm calling H2. No. <laughs> no. Perfect. Not quite the water cooler, but usually in the kitchen of workplace, there's going to be coffee. So we got a coffee beer today. Mm-hmm. We've There's got... still a coffee connection. Oh, Wait there you go. So this is from Bridge Brewing Company in North Vancouver. It's the Uganda Sippy Coffee. It's a smooth, rich, and malty brown ale brewed with an addition of organic Uganda Sippy Falls coffee from our friends at Moja Coffee. The beans are added after fermentation, leading to the soft and fruity coffee aromas. It's 6.1% alcohol. It smells okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes like wet coffee. Did you say wet coffee? Yeah, it tastes wet. Coffee is wet. <laughs> okay, well, water, oh water. water is wet, I know, but it tastes like, I don't know, taste it. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't make All right. fun of you. Well, I try it. It's a, it's a very deep brown, oh kind God, of with red hues. So it's got nice uh, light brown head. It smells kind of like coffee with a bit of cream in it. Are you getting the wet taste? <laughs> <laughs> totally getting some wetness in there, yes. That sounded weird. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> some wet coffee coming out of my nose. Yeah, it's, it's got some like just a hint of like chocolatey notes in the nose. I've had like oh, I've had a fair amount of coffee beers before, but it like it's going to sound ridiculous. It really smells like coffee. Yeah, but it's 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 on the sweeter side of the coffee, so probably mm-hmm. almost a double double or something. Perfect. <laughs> Not perfect. That's too much, but I like it. Yeah, it's kind of like a coffee with cream in it and a little bit of sugar. It's got some chocolate notes, a little bit of roasted malts. Sure. A little earthy. <laughs> Just a tiny bit of bitterness in there. Not much, though. That's good. Yeah, it's more... I mean, it's what you're saying, right? Because of that cream and sugary, it's more smooth than other um, brewed beers I've had before. I'm actually surprised there's no lactose in this because it almost because of the creaminess... You'd almost expect some milk sugars in there. All right, well, why don't we get into it? Was there anything else about the beer you wanted to say? Did you already do the... Bridge Brewing Company is quite um, happy about being 90, 99% waste-free. They make sure to recycle everything they can. Um, all the spent grain goes to farmers. All the paper towels all go into a recycle bin. They do their best to have zero waste. Uh, they use, you know, you recycle the hot water so they don't have to just pour it down the drain. It's pretty impressive, you know. Mm-hmm. The earth can use a little more of that these days, so it's good to see breweries trying to do that because making beer is water hungry. Right. It's resource hungry, mm-hmm. you know, lots of heat, lots of grains. You've got to try to find a way to use those up, and they're doing their best to do that, which is nice to see. Yeah, for sure. It's a good workplace thing. Let's get on to the bad workplace things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On March 22nd of 1986, Julie Williams was enjoying her new job at the Transamerica Title Insurance Company. Julie had been working there for the last two months. It was a typical Monday morning with her four co-workers at the small company in Tempe, Arizona? Tempe. It is Tempe? I've been there, yeah. Oh, fancy. Around 9 a.m., Julie got a drink from the office water cooler She quickly told everyone that something was wrong and not to drink it as the water caused a burning sensation on her lips and tongue. She went to the washroom and two of her co-workers took a small sip but spit it out because of the bitter taste. Of course they did. You knew someone would, right? It's like when someone says, Oh God, this tastes horrible. That green fur that grows on rank dairy products tastes better than this. Here you should try it. (laughs) <laughs> and someone always does. Oh, right? yeah, of course. Because people are stupid and they just have to know for themselves. Yeah. 
So after someone else confirms that there's something wrong with the water, they realize that Julie did not return from the bathroom. Um, They go to check on her and see that she is passed out in one of the stalls. An ambulance is called and Julie is rushed to the hospital, but she's in a coma. Doctors initially thought that she had a stroke, but with further testing, they realize that she's brain dead and would never wake up. Holy shit. Happy Monday, right? Yeah. Fucking Mondays. Uh, I don't want work to kill me. (laughs) Yeah. Garfield was right. Mondays suck. Um, (laughs) Two days later, her three grown daughters had to make the heartbreaking decision to take her off of life support. The hospital advised the police investigating the incident to test the water supply. The tests quickly revealed the presence of cyanide. Because of this, they decided to test basically everything in the break room. Coffee creamer, coffee cups, coffee pot, and water cooler all had cyanide. Wow. So five milligrams of cyanide can kill about 25 people. And the water cooler alone had 32 milligrams. So that's that's enough to kill over 150 people. There's only five people working there. What the fuck? Got to be prepared. I don't know. Better safe than sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Holy shit, though. That is overkill. I guess you got to hire people to replace the people that die. So, <laughs> But how did no one else die? Yeah, I don't know. Like No one else drinks water. <laughs> yeah. That's why I don't drink water. Mm-hmm. Cyanide. Yeah. Because of the cyanide. Yeah, bad news bears. That almond flavored water is never good, right? Yeah. yeah. Not everyone can taste that, though. That's oh. genetic. Uh, it doesn't. Not everyone can taste that um, bitter almond. I hope I never find out. Yeah. yeah. It's not something that you want to. No, like, that cyanide has an almond flavor. Yeah, mm-hmm. like a bitter, but not, yeah. Is that not. why they put it in the Kool-Aid to make it taste better? Jonestown? No? Mm. Could be. Well, flavor aid, actually. Ah. The poor person's <laughs> Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the 12 cents a packet is Recession. pretty pricey. Yes, exactly. Can you even get it Kool-Aid anymore? Yes. Oh, yeah. Can you? Yeah. I'd never see it. I don't know why it. you want to, but you can. I never see it. I it's probably was like, by the jello. <laughs> yeah. Totally. We always had it when I was a kid and uh now I'm amazed. Like the amount of sugar that's in there. I can't believe people it's drink just it. Sugar. <laughs> yeah. And like coloring, but not orange. Ew. Anyway. Oh, um, it's actually from Kraft Foods. Kool Aid. Explains why it's so shitty for you. Mm. <laughs> So how did no one else die? Uh, Whatever was in there must have been added quite recently, as no one else that morning noticed until she had said something. So while questioning Julie's co-workers, police were given a very interesting bit of information. Sandra Diane Harry, she just goes by Diane, suggested that she have may she may have been the intended target. She had recently had a scotch at home that made her very ill, and on another occasion she had used her kettle at home to boil water for tea, but the water immediately curdled the milk. Uh, police got her permission to run tests, and both the scotch and the kettle were laced with cyanide. Huh. Under questioning, Lewis Harry, that's Diane's husband, said he suspected Roy Fitzgerald. Apparently, Roy was the 43-year-old ex of Sharon Jones, who was Lewis's friend. Spoiler alert, they're not friends. (laughs) Yeah. According to Sharon, Lewis had asked her to marry him once his divorce was finalized. Furthermore, he encouraged her to get a restraining order because Roy was verbally and physically abusive. The restraining order is a good decision. No one should be putting up with that shit. And starting a relationship with someone who is married, not a good decision. Uh, But who knows what this Lewis guy had told her was actually going on, right? Right. So no surprise, Roy did not take kindly to the restraining order and one night he even went as far as to follow lewis from sharon's house to his home he quickly realized that lewis was still married and still living with his wife immediately called sharon and told her but she refused to listen so he started sending threatening letters to diane and lewis but i'm like what the fuck did diane do yeah no shit Like, she doesn't even know this is happening. 
Uh, so I don't, I'm not sure why she got the threatening letters, but whatever. Just um, a guy being a douchebag. Yeah. Uh, when police first questioned Roy, he denied even knowing about the letters, but shortly after he went to the lead detective and admitted that he had sent four handwritten letters. Uh, not because of the restraining order, but because Lewis was sleeping with Sharon. He went on to say that three typed letters were not from him. So, like, in total, there There's had seven. been seven threatening letters received, but he'd only sent four. So he didn't know where the other ones came from. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The investigators went back to the typed letters to see if there was any more evidence to be gathered. They noticed that all of the envelopes had the same manufacturing flaw. The part on the back where all the flaps meet in the middle had a folding defect that made them very unique. Police got a warrant to search Lewis's office at a local community college where he worked, and there they found a receipt for cyanide, signed for by Charles Harley, who told the sales agent it was to be used for an experiment in chemistry class. That's quite the experiment for sure. Murdering mm -hmm. people. Yeah. 101. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing I learned about. Of course, yeah. In community college was cyanide. Might have that. been more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I actually did learn about a lot of cool things in college. but Oh, I wish. Yeah, it makes one of us. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Now I'm like, I have a story in my brain and I'm not sure if I should share it or not. But share it. Okay. You should share it? Oh, yeah, of you course. should share Always it. share it. Why are you holding out on us? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we can always cut it. <laughs> True. Well, we did a crime scene investigation. I had a crime scene investigation class. And for our final exam, we actually had to do a, like my professor rented this to kill hotel room. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Uh, I said too much. I'm going to walk away. Uh, no, our professor set up like an actual crime scene um, with like fake blood and everything. And we had to follow all the clues. And then we were just supposed to process the scene. But then we wanted to see like what happened. So we kept following. And we ended up getting all these bonus marks for actually trying to find out what happened and not just processing the scene. It was fun. What did you take in school? Um, it was for uh, fire safety and security administration, but our teacher had, was, um, well, I mean, the head of the program was interested in... How to get away with murder? Well, no, it was like his second year as head of the program, and he just really wanted to expand it and make it as amazing as possible. Okay, but back to, back to the case. So this Charles Harley had signed for the cyanide, claiming it was for a chemistry class, and... Um, although the name was different, Charles Harley and Lewis Harry had a remarkably similar handwriting. Um, the S at the end of the first name and the Y at the end of the surname were identical in each signature. And the sales, when the sales agent was shown a lineup, he identified Lewis Harry as the man that he had sold the cyanide to. What a dick. While conducting their search, they also found a box of envelopes. Three of the envelopes. 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 Beer is fun. Um, <laughs> feel free to leave that in. I'm fine with that. Okay. <laughs> Three of the envelopes from that box had the same manufacturer's defect as the ones that contained the threatening letters. You could even see the progression of the envelopes where the defect slowly goes away and then is no longer there. That's hmm. cool. Uh, on the shelf of his office, there were trace amounts of cyanide. So this is all great evidence, but how the hell would he have gotten in Diane's office to put the cyanide in there? So the office security system showed that Diane's card was used to get into the office on the Saturday morning prior to the murder. Hmm. Diane was very adamant that she was not at the office that weekend, and no one saw a woman enter a, at all that day. Between 10 and 10.30, a workman, just like a contract worker that was there, um, did see a man enter. He also remembered seeing a tennis racket in this man's blue sports car. Lewis had a blue car and played tennis all the time. So huh. That's what you get for playing tennis. Yeah. Douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> um, police uh, arrest Lewis for Julie's murder and the attempted murder of Diane. Uh, 
they suspected that he was unhappy in his marriage to Diane. They were three years into their marriage when he met Sharon while out at a bar one night. She was a student at the college where he worked. Gross. That along with the fact that Diane had a $75,000 life insurance policy with Lewis as the beneficiary seemed like a solid motive. Because money and people are stupid. Yes. At the trial, Diane and Sharon sat together. Neither of them believed that Lewis could possibly be the killer. Idiots. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> He's just such a nice guy. Yeah. Oh, he wouldn't do that to me. Cyanide, guys. <laughs> he wanted to do that. Like, yeah. Hmm. They found cyanide at your house, where you live, with someone who had access to your work pass, where they found cyanide, and he was fucking around on you, and you still think he's innocent. How? Why? People like, are stupid. Lewis Harry was convicted of first-degree murder and four counts of attempted murder. Uh, he started serving his life sentence in February of 1987. He was 33 and must serve 95 years before he is eligible for parole. After the trial, Diane's brother found more cyanide in the attic of the house that she shared with Lewis, and she was finally convinced that he was guilty. Sharon continued to visit Lewis in prison for another two decades after he was convicted, before she finally realized that he was guilty. What a fucking well, waste of time. It, at least it only took 20 years. Right? 20 fucking years <laughs> to realize. Like, yeah. how old was she if she was attending this community college? That's almost half her life. Yeah. Jesus. And I mean, she's at post-secondary. She's not dumb. Debatable. Yeah. But wow. <laughs> yeah. Thinking back of the people that I went to college with. Not all of them, of course, but some yeah, of them. That's, Holy that's shit. true. Um, so the last mention I found of him was from 2015, uh, and he still claims his innocence. He's still saying that it wasn't him, that he's innocent, in spite of multiple people identifying him and cyanide being found in his office, in his house. And he's still saying he's innocent. Wow. Yeah. Doesn't surprise Horrible. me, though. No one's guilty in prison. Nope. Yeah, everybody's innocent, right? But, like, that's so fucking horrible. This woman, Julie Williams, dies, and it had nothing to do with her. Right. Yeah. I mean, not that it would have been any better if Diane had died. You know what I mean? That's still horrible, obviously. Yeah. But I don't understand people. Like, he could have unintentionally killed half a dozen people. Oh, yeah. For $75,000? What's wrong with you? Well, I would start with everything. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. Anyway, that's my case. People are stupid. Yes, but they are. But we already knew that. And Mondays suck. Yeah. And not only secret agents use cyanide. And don't drink water. <laughs> yeah, don't drink water. <laughs> the moral of the story is... Yes. Uh, don't drink water. Hydrate with beer. Yeah. Alcohol is safe. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it disinfects. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it actually disinfects from cyanide, but well, there's someone one else way can to try. Find out. Yeah, not us though. Someone else no. try. No. Yeah. But we didn't tell you to. No. Yeah. <laughs> Safety first. Don't eat cyanide. Please. It's like that's just usually like secret agents, you know, cyanide pill, cyanide mm -hmm. cap in your tooth, and you break it to kill yourself in yeah. case you get caught. But also, how with cyanide did you manage to attempt murder other people? Like you suck. You can't use cyanide to kill people. Like yeah. only one. Only one out of five. Yeah. Bad performance. Yeah. It's just like, it's such a horrible plan. Yeah. Like if, if he wanted his wife killed. And he tried to twice at home and couldn't do it? a communal water cooler. Mm. Like. Well, obviously he's stupid. Mm -hmm. He definitely is stupid. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get on to the next story. Do you want to give a hint of what your story is about? Sure. Just so like a title or something. Going postal. So I'm going to focus on just um, highlighting different cases about it, where the term came from, and uh, round it off with some fun facts about going batshit. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, I've paired a beer with this uh, story. Usually it's do uh, man's best friend, but uh, dogs sure seem to hate postal workers. <laughs> so we've got the Red Collar Brewing Rocket Dog Dark Session IPA. 
Meet Rocket Dog, a dark session IPA brewed with a wealth of out of this world hops. One could call this beer a black hole of hops as it is technically void of any bitterness, but in reality, it's bursting with flavor. A zero IBU enigma that ventures into the far reaches of your palate. Space isn't that lonely when there's beer. Houston, we have a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the first thing I'm noticing, this is a dark session IPA, but it is not a black IPA because it is definitely like a deep, like amber or something. It's not black. It's like brandy. Yeah. Very light, tannish head. Again, the aroma's not big. You could kind of get some malty notes, maybe a hint of some fruit I can't pick out, but really not a lot to it. It's good, though. I like it. Yeah, it's got a like a very light maltiness. Mm maybe a hint of roast which is surprising there isn't more with a dark ipa no bitterness at all really Mm -mm. and it's got it's got fruity notes but i can't tell you what those fruits are there's almost a hint of coffee or something in the end that could just be the last beer we had though (laughs) yeah still on your tongue it's nice though it is 4.4 percent alcohol and it's actually vegan what what well, why? you know, there's a little dog logo with three dots, so maybe he's thinking the same thing. Why? Are other what? beers not like... Oh, yeah. I guess if they have... Um, what did you say? The lactose? Lactose. Or lactose. There is some breweries that use finding agents, they're called, to filter their beer. Instead of using a filter, they add in something, and it's those finding agents can be made out of parts of fish bladders and weird stuff. So there are beers that definitely aren't vegan. Mm. But unless you're a vegan, you don't even think about that. No, yeah, I love vegan me. No. I don't think more about non-vegan that. things. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, exactly. More steak for me. So. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, going postal. Okay, so with my story, so as I had mentioned earlier, I'm going to highlight a couple of the cases, go over the term, kind of where it originated from, um, and fun facts. Or I don't know if they're fun because people died, but they're facts. Um, So going postal is a slang phrase referring to becoming extremely and uncontrollably angry, often to the point of violence and, of course, usually in a workplace environment. Between 1970 and 1997, there's more than 40 people who were killed by current or former employees in at least 20 incidents of workplace rage. And between 1986 and 2011, roughly two shootings per year, on average killing 12 people a year. While researching this originally, hearing about going postal, I thought it was specifically to USPS, but it's essentially just any mail carrier. Most of them have been USPS. I'm not sure what's in their water, but they're kind of the more angry ones. There's a lot of guns in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> guns. Were your, your stats are American? True. Then? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the earliest known use of the phrase was on December 17th in 1993 in the St. Petersburg Times. I uh, looked at the article. There's nothing interesting about it other than just saying going postal. Hmm. Um, One of the things that I also found amusing was that USPS specifically tried to get the term removed from the article because they didn't (laughs) want to make it a thing. Yeah, I bet they did. I don't blame them. Yeah, Yeah. they didn't want it to be a thing. However, uh, the USPS worker specifically came out and said, no, it should be a term. And they asked to coin it um, because they feel it earned its place. And that was kind of disrespectful to people who died, saying that it wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, So while researching the term as well, I found, um, which I found kind of sad to be truthful, in that more than 50% of the cases, the postal workers who went out to shoot and murder their fellow employees uh, ended up also committing suicide. So you'd wonder if, you know, in the workplace, had they given the proper guidance or resources, maybe these people wouldn't lose their shit and then mm-hmm. kill other people and then plus themselves. It just seems like a um, waste for everyone. Essentially. Yeah. Un- unfortunately, when people go postal or whatever mm-hmm. in general, usually the idea is to kill a bunch of people and then either kill yourself or suicide by a cop. Absolutely. That's usually the point. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're usually at the end of your rope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've lost it. Yeah. So. I think if more places <clears throat> had um, like readily available, like compensation for mental health, yeah, yep, and not just physical health. It's like a, it's an extended benefit, but it shouldn't it should be a yeah. primary benefit, right? Yeah, when you break your arm, everyone sees it. When you break your brain, 
no one sees it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really unfortunate. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to highlight as well is at all the stats I was looking at, I was just wanted to make sure that this was an only a thing that was happening in the United States. And, uh, basically was, uh, because Merca. Uh, so there was two in Australia <laughs> <laughs> documented cases <laughs> yeah. and one in Canada. Yeah. But the one in Canada was a postal uh, worker who just shot one of the people he was delivering mail to. So technically not was... workplace, but still not good. Uh, but essentially everything else is uh, strictly United States. So those are friendly neighbors to the, mm-hmm. where are they? South. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Quote unquote, Friendly. Friendly, yes. yes. Okay. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the cases that I wanted to highlight and share with everyone today is, um, first one is from Ridgewood, New Jersey in 1991. Former United States postal worker Joseph Harris killed his former supervisor, Carol Ott, and killed her boyfriend, Cornelius Caston Jr., at their home. While doing research on this particular one, I couldn't figure out why he also killed her boyfriend, but... I'm assuming he was just wrong place, wrong time and uh, there. Yeah. Uh, the following morning uh, on October 10th uh, in 91, of course, Harris shot and killed two male handlers as well. Uh, Joseph Vanderpaw and Donald McNaught, not naughty, not something like that um, at the Ridgewood post office. Um, one of the things that you'll see highlighted through all the cases, most of them happened at the post office or in the parking lot in front. Interesting. Yeah. Well, works with the whole workplace violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, The next case that I have is uh, occurred in Royal Oak, Michigan in 1991 as well. On November 14th um, in Royal Oak, Michigan, Thomas McIvan, I think it's pronounced, killed five people, including himself with a rifle in Royal Oak's post office. After being fired from the Postal Service for insubordination, He had been previously suspended for getting into altercations with postal customers on his route. Um, I had to Google insubordination. For those that don't know what that means, mainly me, uh, is (laughs) 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 you guys are looking at me because you know, but uh, defiance of authority and uh, refusal to obey orders. I've known a lot of people like that. I think I'm sometimes that person too. (laughs) Oh, okay. Good. good. I think everyone on our team is sometimes. We can, we can have our postal moments. Yeah, as long as you don't go beyond <laughs> just having a little insubordination. Mm-hmm. No, and... That's what, what curse words are for. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah. And <laughs> that's what the... As for my last email, are yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the verbal bitch slap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to add to this, when Beck had asked me to come and uh, speak today and share... I was started Googling at work. I'm like, I probably shouldn't be Googling <laughs> high murder rate, successful murders at work. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like this is a at home in bed on my tablet kind of uh, activity. Probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back to the um, serious stuff, not serious stuff. I don't know. Um, we had two <laughs> other events happen in 1993. Uh, two shootings took place on the same day on May 6th in 93, a few hours apart. Uh, One was at a post office in Dearborn, Michigan. Lawrence Jason wounded three and killed one, and then subsequently killed himself. Same day, uh, Dana Point, California. Mark Richard Hilburn killed his mother and her dog. He shot two postal workers dead. Um, As a result of these two shootings in 1993, uh, USPS created 95 workplace environmental analysis for domicile at its 85 postal districts these new positions were created to help with violence prevention and improve uh, the workplace however as americans do in february 2009 uh, usps unilaterally unilaterally unilaterally, unilaterally, thank you eliminated these positions as part of downsizing efforts Mm -hmm. so it wasn't important enough big surprise Well, Mm -hmm. it is what it is, I guess. Next, I have, this took place in Goleta, California in 2006. This is our first female postal lady. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't know if she's a lady. Breaking the gender barrier. Equal opportunity. (laughs) Equal rage. Guns, yes. Um, Her name is Jennifer San Marco, a former postal employee, of course. 
uh, killed six employees before committing suicide with a handgun on the evening of January 30th in 2006 at a large postal processing facility in California. Police later also identified a seventh victim dead in the condominium complex where Jennifer lived. Uh, so she just shot her neighbor, went to work, and did did the damn thing. I guess if you don't like your neighbor, you might as well start there, right? I mean, if you're going to go out, you know, do, you do you, boo, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, according to media reports, uh, the Postal Service had uh, forced Jennifer to retire early because of her worsening mental problems. So as opposed to helping her and trying to make her better, it was like maybe breaking up with us was what we should do, which that is obviously what triggered sense. these events. And to highlight, uh, this incident is believed to be the deadliest workplace shooting ever carried out in the United States by a woman. So there's that. Let's not beat that know. record, please. Yeah. No, six is a good number. It's high enough. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. The next case I have is from Baker City, Oregon in 2006. Grant Gallagher, a letter carrier in Baker City, Oregon, uh, pleaded guilty on April 4th in 2006 uh, for murdering his supervisor. And this guy is a gem. He brought his 357 Magnum revolver to the post office with the intention of killing his um, postmaster. Um, when he arrived at the parking lot, he happened to see his supervisor, who he then ran over several times, oh. hmm. went inside, couldn't find his direct postmaster, which is, I guess, his direct supervisor dude. Yeah. So because he couldn't find him, he went back out, found the supervisor that he ran over, and shot him a couple times. Wow. Wow. So yeah, it's... He's and finishing I, the job, I guess. Wow. Yeah, I thought the excessive amounts of cyanide was overkill. No, run him over and then come back, finish the job. I respect someone who finishes. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, finish what you started, I guess. Yeah. I mean, feel bad for the supervisor who thought, like, hey, it's over. I'm just going to lay here as a cripple. It's like, oh, no, he's back. Yeah. (laughs) God. Yeah. Uh, Next, I have a case in San Francisco, California in 2017. This is the most recent one that I was able to find. Uh, June 14th of 2017, Jimmy Lamb fatally shot three co-workers at a United Parcel Service at UPS facility in Portrero Hill in a neighborhood in San Francisco. He then later shot and killed himself as police arrived at the facility. Uh, two others were wounded by gunfire and three people were injured while um, trying to escape. I have one more case. Um, this is the most people who were killed. Um, it happened in Edmond, Oklahoma in 1986. On August 20th, during the Edmond Post Office shooting, 40 employees were shot and killed and six were wounded at the Edmond, Oklahoma Post by Patrick Sherrill. Random fact, he looks like Willie Picton. I don't know if oh, that God. has anything to do with anything, but if you Google it too, we'll put some pictures up, but they're like homies, bros, like there was some debauchery there. Brothers some terrible, another mother. terrible yeah. long... <laughs> Long hair, but totally bald at the same time. Yeah, he's just like What's fugly, that, dirty uh, as hell. Skullets. That's yeah, what that's yeah, called. Definitely. Right? Yeah, definitely. Skullet, yeah. Disgusting. Yeah. Greasy, yeah. too, I bet. He looked like a greasy fuck, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> who also, to end that off, uh, committed suicide by shooting himself in the forehead. Mm-hmm. One other thing I wanted to point out with this, while researching, um, I came up with six wounded, and often a couple articles mentioned seven wounded, so I couldn't confirm the six or seven. But for sure, he murked 14 people. One of the things with his cases that I found kind of badass, if I can say badass, is that he walked... No swearing. Sorry. Shit. No fucking fucking swearing. Come on now. Whoops. Whoopsie do. (laughs) Whoopsie do. (laughs) Is that... That's a thing, right? We say that? Okay. So this piece of shit, uh, Patrick, he essentially walked into his old place of work. He had just been fired. What was... Why was he fired? Because he, it was demanded for him to increase his productivity and he couldn't. Um, so over time, he wasn't showing improvement. So he got fired. He came back with two forty fives and essentially just shot the place up. Wow. He didn't have an intended uh, co-worker, none of that fun planning. I don't know. He just went for it. Another thing I found curious as well is on the afternoon before the killings, 
he actually approached a female clerk who had been kind to him and asked if she was coming to work the next day. And she said, of course. And he actually told her to stay home. So, you know, there's a point. So she did stay home? Uh, yeah, she was not one of the people wounded or murdered. Mm. Couldn't confirm if she actually stayed home or not, but she did not get shot up. Mm. And um, that's what I have for cases. Wow. A couple of facts is one of my personal favorites, which I, I guess is being recorded and people are going to know about it now, is a movie called Clueless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Yeah, don't be sorry. Yeah. You like what you like. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Again, you do you. Yeah. <laughs> you do you, boo-boo. It's fine. <laughs> uh, so in the movie Clueless, before the term going postal was popularized, they were asked to use the term while filming without actually knowing the impact of it. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was great. Um, of course, another classic, Jumanji, which I just realized also came out in 1995, like Clueless, maybe some connection. Mm -hmm. um, Hunter Van Pelt, so the dad who comes back as the hunter dude, mm -hmm. uh, runs out of shells for his rifle and goes to a nearby gun shop. And the shopkeep asks the hunter, you're not a postal worker, are you? Another random fact is David Richard Berkowitz, more commonly known as Son of Sam. Boo. Boo Ernst. <laughs> yeah. He is an American serial killer who pleaded guilty to eight separate shootings um, and attacks that began in New York City. He also worked for a USPS or UPS. I have one or the other, but maybe tied to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what happened. Who knows? And last thing, there was also a going postal TV movie series that had a whopping two episodes in 2010. One thing about it that I found not truthful, they had a team of postal workers go in and shoot a building up. That's not of any of the cases I found is usually one solo person going in and doing all the um, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Was that based off of the uh, Rockstar Games postal I was totally going to bring that up. We absolutely had that game when I was a kid. Did you really? I and never I, did. Uh, Nina, when you had mentioned what your topic was for mm -hmm. this at you work. This, yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, it's what it sounds like. It's a game where you just walk around shooting literally everyone you yep. see, blowing up every building. Yeah. Like, just destroying everything. That's the point of the game. It's senseless, right? You're and just I'm just like... I can't believe I played this game when I was a kid. There's no way I would let my daughter play this game. Or not be, I mean, not because she's a girl or any bullshit like Child. that. I would not play, and I would not let any kid play this game. Yeah. I played horrible. a lot of Grand Theft Auto, which is by the same guys. Yeah, no, we, yeah, that, we had that, that too. <laughs> Back in the day. Or Carmageddon. Or their other popular one, Man, uh, was it, was it Manhunt, was it? Where you literally just snuck up on people and murdered them yeah. from behind. So much Rockstar like Games has stuff. some <laughs> gems. I'm the, I'm the worst. I play Call of Duty, but I'm like the piece of shit that hides in a corner and snipe people as they walk by. So, yeah, I'm not not very orthodox. So weird. No. That my so favorite weird. game was that Manhunt game on the Wii. Yeah. So you actually used motion controls <laughs> <laughs> to kill people. <laughs> yeah, no. But that's everything I had. Awesome. In this case. I guess not wow. awesome, but... <laughs> Yeah, wow. it's cool. I'll see you at work, Beck. <laughs> I love you. Good. I love you. Don't if you don't me. hear from me, please email us at Brew Crimes. <laughs> no. I'm fine. Or call nine one one. Yeah. <laughs> Duck and cover. It's yeah, fine. no doubt. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. Got this. Fingers crossed. Yeah. So there. Just before I uh, left home to come here and record today, I saw. Uh, I read about a case. Not It's not a case. I read about something in the States. Big shocker. Uh, there is a company in Hortonville, Wisconsin, and for Christmas this year, they are giving all of their employees handguns. <laughs> that reminds me of the scene in Bowling and Columbine. Where yeah, both Columbine, yeah. You go get a bank loan, and for getting a bank loan, you get a gun. Yeah. Why are you giving people guns in banks? Yeah. Idiots. Yeah. yeah. But, well, you go get your bank account or your loan. And then you hold them up for more money. Yeah. So the uh, apparently the idea behind this is that will it it will promote personal safety and team building. <laughs> so shoot some ducks yeah. or each other. I mean, yeah. the only 
the only thing I will give this company is that um, they're not actually giving any of the employees a gun until they go do the gun safety course. Oh, right, safety course. Yeah. But Why? only in America is what I have to say. And I'm not, like, shitting all over all Americans because I do have some <laughs> friends in the States. I got lots of friends But in the they States. would shit on this idea, too. Yeah. This is stupid. You don't give people a handgun as a Christmas gift. Yeah. I mean, some people, okay, but, I mean, as the owner of a company, handguns for Christmas, really. Yeah. Might as well throw in some concealed carry permits with it. At least they're get getting it. something from their company for Christmas. I mean, that's a bright side. <laughs> and at least they're talking about safety because some companies don't talk about it. It's true. So talking about it makes it a thing I and guess. a solution in this case. I'll go Use for a cash gun. bonus. I don't know. I'd yes. rather have the cash. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather live another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Whatever. Robert. <laughs> Whatever. And Luckily, as far as like postal carriers in the States go, I think that if they did the financial testing on it, they would find that it's cheaper to have like mental awareness, um, counseling, yep. counseling, yeah, and all that. It's going to be a lot cheaper than having to pay um, like medical bills yeah. and all everything getting sued. Don't I'm forget sure. that in Republican states, Ugh. free health care or you know universal health care is communism. And that's evil. Yeah, I'll otherwise. just stick with having a nice, mild socialist Canada where we have healthcare that doesn't bankrupt you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know, but that's the whole topic of gun control, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. is gun control having a safety class, or why do you need a gun? Like, why? Yeah, I don't need a gun because no. I live in Canada. Yeah, and I don't live in a rural area where I'm going to hunt. Yeah, I'm not a hunter. Or so if I don't I've need got, you know, a whole herd of cattle and there's cougars or friggin' yeah, fine. bears that you have to fight off. Yeah, you need a gun. Yeah. That's fine. But I don't, I don't need a gun. There's no reason that I would need a conceal. Sometimes Costco no. parking lot, I wish I had a fucking gun. <laughs> that was my parking spot, you piece of shit. But isn't it better that you don't have it at yeah. that point? Yeah. I definitely would not be here with you guys today. I'd be in jail. Just like rotting away with Piggy exactly. Pigton. <laughs> Piggy Pigton. Piggy Pigton. <laughs> yeah, pig pen. Yeah, Piggy's Palace. It's fine. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> hey, that's his place. That's what yeah, it's I, called. I bar. went to someone. Totally. I went to BCIT with someone who actually went to one of his parties. Ugh. No. Yes. Oh my God. I don't talk to him anymore. <laughs> is he in jail? No. Does he own a gun? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> the pause is question. Yeah, I'm not saying that owning a gun is a bad thing. I mean, I have like a lot of family members and they hunt and find they have guns because they hunt. Yeah. Not Animals. for protection. Yeah. Yeah. They're not worried about the fucking King of England coming over. You know, that's stupid. <laughs> Do we have a King of Not no. currently. Oh, okay. I was but like, hold on. Whoa. <laughs> that's an American mentality yeah. thing. The, well, I mean, any country that has to episode. fear the government that much. Yeah. Next episode of talking about America. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. All right. Let's get on to the next story. The name I gave this is When Brew Meets Crime. That's appropriate. Yeah. Finally, we have an actual story that involves beer in some way. <laughs> That's so get... sad, though, potentially. Eh, yeah, I know. Yes, but no. First off, I'll shout out to Reddit user Simply Tennessee for the idea for this story. Oops. So the beer I've picked for this episode is from Kona Brewing Company out of the Big Island of Hawaii. The reason why I tied this in is that Kona Brewing, as well as a couple other breweries, are partially owned by AB InBev, and that will tie in to this uh, story. So if you're thinking AB InBev, you're thinking Budweiser and all that stuff. So it's not fully independent anymore. But it's actually a really cool brew pub on the Big Island. No, so I this... have a reason to go to Hawaii. Oh, there's lots beer. of good beer in Hawaii. Mm. But um, this is the Big Wave Golden Ale. It's available year-round, and it's available locally here in Vancouver. The Big Wave is a lighter-bodied golden ale with tropical hop aroma and flavor. Smooth, easy drinking, and refreshing. The use of caramel malt contributes to the golden hue of this beer, and our special blend of hops provide a bright, quenching finish that makes it uh, struggle to not grab another one. It has that golden color, small off-white head. Kind of a sort of general citrusy aroma. A little sweet, little floral. 
What do you think? Tastes like beer. I like it. <laughs> it's got like a slight lemony note to it. Mm-hmm. It's grainy. And there's a light, light little earthiness in the back. And it's, t- it's sort of a little bit sweet. Mm. It's the right level of uh, hops for me. I yep. don't really... Real, I don't specifically enjoy uh, hops forward. Yeah, beer. I, I'm guessing it's they're probably me. getting a little bit of the fruit notes from the hops. Yeah, but there's not really any bitterness to this. Yeah. And what did I say? Did I say it is 4.4 percent alcohol by volume? And for people that don't know, Kona Brewing is on the Big Island, but basically all their bottled beer is brewed in Portland, Oregon. At one of the other breweries, it's owned in the same craft beer alliance. Mm-hmm. Bottling beer in Hawaii is really expensive because there's no plant that makes bottles. So you have to Import. ship the bottles, fill them, and then ship them back to the mainland. So they just basically do all of the brewing for their bottles here and then ship the bottles back one way to Hawaii. Makes a little more sense. There's people that aren't happy with that because the purists they want it to be brewed locally they want it to be independent but it's bottle still a good beer yeah. i like the bottle too it's cute yeah it's Pers- got it's precised it's got yeah. some uh native hawaiians rowing in a canoe with a big wave crashing over them well this show is called brew crime so here is a case that involves both brews and crime on october 3rd 2010 all hell broke loose in Manchester, Connecticut. A recently fired employee of the beer distribution company Hartford Distributors, who distributes primarily Anheuser-Busch and Heineken beer, opened fire killing multiple people. Another American tragedy tonight. Another worker with a gun and a grudge. This time, nine people are dead. The worst rampage since 13 were killed last November at Fort Hood, Texas. Omar Sharif Thompson born April 25th, 1976, had previously been implicated in the stealing of empty kegs from his work. The delivery driver on the day of August 3rd had been called into the office for another reason, though. He had recently been caught on surveillance video stealing beer from the warehouse. For this, his time working for Hartford Distributors was done. They gave him two choices, though, in his termination. He could be fired and have that affect his future employment, or he could resign on the spot. He took the second option and signed the resignation papers. Company Vice President Steve Hollander told Associated Press that he was cool and calm. He didn't yell. He was cold as ice. He didn't protest when we were meeting with him to show him the video of him stealing. He didn't contest it. He didn't complain. He didn't argue. He didn't admit or deny anything. He just agreed to resign. He grabbed his lunch kit and was to be escorted out of the building, and things seemed to be going all right. And then as Hollander finished, and quote, and then he just unexplainedly pulled out his gun and started blasting. He stashed two Ruger SR9 semiotic pistols in his lunchbox. How big was his lunchbox? Mm -hmm. Fairly large, I think. But I think think they're still handguns, so, you know, a typical, like, tin lunch kit or something. This attack happened around 7 a.m. during a shift change that ensured that the largest amount of employees would be on site. The estimations of how many people range from a low of 40 to a high of 70. But either way, (laughs) that is a large number of people to be in the crosshairs. When he pulled his gun, he was standing near his boss and two other people. Omar shot the two other people in the head and killed them both. He then shot his boss twice, once in the jaw and once in the arm. And he is quoted, he shot me twice and he hit me a couple times. And just by the grace of God, I don't know how he missed me. When the shooting started, multiple employees called 911 to report the shooting. And some people identified Omar as the shooter and pointed out he basically was the only black man that worked there. Steve that Holland. Matters? Yeah. I guess it only matters because when you're trying to give an explanation of like a physical identification. You know, it's, if, if everyone's not black, then there is one identifier. But otherwise, yeah, totally. Steve Hollander also called 911 once Omar had left his office. He was quoted later as saying, I was on the phone with 911, and then I saw him running outside my office window, shooting his gun, carrying his lunchbox, which must have been where the weapons were stored. And also, it doesn't seem real to me now. It seems like I'm watching a movie. 
911. I need the cops here at Hartford Distributors right away, shooting. What's going on? Who got Somebody shot? Somebody got shot. I got shot. Okay, I need some information, sir. Who Somebody, got shot? Somebody, we need the cops. What, Omar Thornton's shooting people. I just got shot. Okay, I need to know what his name is. His name is right? Omar Thornton. He's a black guy. Get the cops here right away, please. Sir, stay on the line with me. My partner all over the place. Okay. How many people got shot? I don't know. Okay, you don't know. And you're shot where? In my head. You're shot in the head? Yeah. And what's your name? My name is Steve Hollander. Okay. I was that shot shot Who's the person shooting people again? His name is Omar Thornton. He's a black guy. He's wearing shorts. Okay, black man, shorts, anything else, what kind of gun? I don't understand. Um, there's, I mean, I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts and they play the 911 calls and I'm frequently like... I don't understand um, the questions that they're asking. Like when he he calls and he's like, this is what's happening. This is what I need. This is who's doing it. And she's just like, oh, just wait a minute. And I get that they have like a protocol and they need you to record everything. And I, I understand that. But I'm also kind of like... Could you have made this a Could more you send the cops and then we can sit down and yeah. chat? I just got shot in the fucking head. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think often the cops are already on the way, but right. there's kind of a script they've got to follow to try to get as much information as possible. But and then at least say, the sir, the police are on their way. Yeah. Let me I get still details. need to record yeah. these details. Yeah. And then, I mean, there's also, depending on where you are, smaller rural places don't get the training they should. Well, that's user error, though, right? Yeah, I know. Totally. Yeah. But he sounded very calm, considering he was shot in the head. Yeah. The, it, um, Shock is a wonderful thing, I think, that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Adrenaline. Blood yeah. everywhere. Goals. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. So Omer ran around the warehouse as well as he as running outside to murder his former co-workers. He even had to shoot out a window to get access back into the warehouse as the door was locked. In only eight minutes, he had shot and killed eight co-workers and injured two others. Only three minutes after his 911 call... The police had arrived on scene. So they got there fast. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was really fucking fast. But they did not just storm in as they had to assess the situation as this was still an active shooter situation. Right. Once Omar realized the cops had arrived, he locked himself in an office to hide from the police. He called his mother to explain what he had done, saying, I killed five racists that were bothering me. He then told his mother that he planned to turn the gun on himself, saying, that's it. The cops are going to come in, so I am going to take care of myself. His mother pleaded with him for another 10 minutes to change his mind. Sadly for his mother, she was unable to change his mind. You know, talking about committing suicide. Might as well take what's coming to you. But it's cute. He called his mom. Mama's boy. (laughs) Yeah, no shit. Dying seconds. Sad, though. Yeah. Omar then called 911, saying his motive for the massacre was racism. He had been experiencing in the workplace. He even told the dispatcher that he wished he had killed more people. Soon after hanging up the phone, with the police closing in on Omar, he turned the gun on himself. He shot himself in the head. When police searched his car, they also found at least one more gun, but did not provide details. The names of the people that he killed are as follows. Francis Fazio Jr., 57. Douglas Scrutton, 56. Edwin Kenningson, 49. William Ackerman, 51. Brian Sigalano, 51. Craig Pepin, 60. Louis Felder, 50. Victor James, 61. And he wounded Stephen Hollander, 50. And Jerome Roselstein, 77. Wow. That guy should have retired. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... I don't know. I mean, I work in a different workplace. Everyone's pretty, pretty darn young, I feel like, at our... That we work with. Yeah. Like that Nina and I work with. It's weird to hear. This definitely sounds like an old boys club. Mm. His claim of killing racists seems to be backed up by his family. And I will lay out some of that now. None of it stops the fact that the massacre makes Omar Sharif Thornton a monster. His mother and his other family members continue to state that he was being racially discriminated at work as he was one of the only African-American employees at the distributor. His family claims that he had sent them photos of the threats that his co-workers supposedly sent. His girlfriend, Christy Hanna, even claims that she received a photo from him showing a noose and a racial epitaph written on the bathroom wall. What the fuck? 
One thing is for sure, his victims were all Caucasian. I hate people. <laughs> so do I. But if they're racist, why would they hire him? Right? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, there there are lots of racist people that have employees that are of other Races. ethnicities. Mm-hmm. It, it could, you know, I, I like I said, I don't know the story because there's no concrete proof mm-hmm. that it was racism. But I mean, you just have to look at the United, southern United States it's, to it's see. It's horrible. Yeah. It's a chance. It's a thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, there is definitely a chance. His family claims that he had, on more than one occasion, complained to his union rep about the racism in his workplace. This has been categorically denied by both the company and union officials, though. Union rep Christopher Ruse said, It's got nothing to do with race. This is a disgruntled employee who shot a bunch of people. The union rep went on to state that he had never filed a complaint with the union or any government agency. So again, who knows? Yeah. I'd still be curious to see these messages that he sent to his family. Yeah. And the picture his girlfriend got. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fine and dandy for them to say that he never officially filed something, but yeah. I mean, they could be lying, right? No, definitely. Yeah, it's totally a chance of that. On top of that, the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities said that Harford Distributors had never had a complaint filed against it, which is pretty impressive because there's almost always a file against companies for something. The police did not take the racism claim lightly, though, and opened a probe into it. After interviewing other minority workers at Harper Distributors, those workers stated that the allegations that the company was a racist place were false. In the end, they found no proof that Harper Distributors had a racist culture. So again, right. who knows? Who knows, yeah. It does seem odd that an employee that had received no disciplinary issues up until the thefts would snap like this, though. But we will never know the true reasons as he took the coward's way out by committing suicide. It is unknown just how much beer he had stolen from his workplace, though. This next bit is a quote. Ten seconds before he started shooting, if you had asked me, does he look like he's going to react in any way? I would have said no. He seems calm, Steve Hollander said. It makes no sense the people he killed. Why would somebody do such a thing? They were his co-workers. They never harmed him in any way. There were a few arrests in this case, though. Christy Quayle and Sean Quayle were both arrested for receiving stolen property from Omar, which I can only assume is either the beer or the empty kegs that were stolen. Why steal empty kegs? You could try to sell them for scrap. You could try to sell them to other distributors or breweries. I mean, or unless you emptied them yourself. No, they were already empty when they were stolen. I'm not sure if it's the same incident or another, but on August 17th, Sean Quayle was also arrested for spraying bug repellent into the faces of reporters covering the case. <laughs> Just trying to help Be you. Be gone. Mosquito. Swear yeah. to God. <laughs> Swear to God, there was a mosquito. You're bugging me. Yeah. <laughs> Off. Quayle was charged with three counts of first degree reckless endangerment, three counts of third degree assault, carrying a dangerous instrument, and breach of the peace. But His lunchbox. The bug spray? The bug spray? The bug spray, yes. Oh, okay. the lunchbox? No. No, that was Omar. That was Omar. <laughs> he might have had a lunch case. You never know, right? Where did he keep the bug spray? Exactly. <laughs> lunchbox. Yeah. This is considered the deadliest workplace shooting in Connecticut history with a death toll of eight people plus the shooter. I'm not going to count him in the death toll. The deadliest mass shooting in the state history, though, is a tragic Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Mm where 28 people were killed, including the shooter and the shooter's mother. I do not understand why the school shooting is not considered a workplace shooting, though, as it happened at a business that just happened to be a school. Maybe it's because it was not an employee that shot the place up. But it's still a workplace crime. Yeah. I don't know, but... Yeah, the school shootings are something that we're never going to cover. No, and I'm never going to mention the killer's name, but... Yeah. If anything good can be taken from these two Herford crimes is this. On April 3rd, 2013, Connecticut General Assembly passed a 139-page major gun control bill with broad bipartisan support. Yes, both sides of the political landscape signed off on this. Hallelujah. Wow. Yeah. It's only one state, but fuck, someone did it. Something. Yeah. The bill requires that all people that want to purchase guns must go through a universal background check. 
They created the first registry in the United States for dangerous weapons offenders and added over 100 types of guns to the state's assault weapon ban. They also banned high-capacity magazines for guns. Pro-gun groups that do not deserve to be named protested this new law outside the state capitol prior to the signing and also challenged it in court. Luckily, federal judge Alfred Cavello ruled in January 2014 to uphold this new law. What has come from this is a drop to the fifth lowest gun death rate in the United States by 2016. Connecticut's gun death rates are on decline by 2.2% annually, while the national average is rising by 17% every year in the last decade. Ridiculous. Reports state that Alaska has the highest gun ownership rate and more than 50% or 56% of homes having guns and also has the highest rate of gun deaths while states like Connecticut with strict gun laws have lower percentages of gun deaths and ownership with only a gun ownership of 22%. It's not rocket science that if you make it harder to get guns, less people will die. Canada has a lot of guns, but we do not have the same issues. Much of it has to do with strict gun laws that keep guns out of the hands of criminals, domestic abusers, people that do not pass psychological background checks, and the likes. If you get a restricted gun license, it gets even more strict with monthly criminal record checks. We do not fuck around with gun laws, and it shows. So fuck groups that continue to have people mowed down in the name of freedom. Uh, on that note, there was uh, something I recently read online, and it is, was that in Iowa, they upheld a law stating that even people who are legally blind are still allowed to own a gun. Because there was actually, why not? Because what was why not? in Bowling for Columbine, mm-hmm. I forget what state it was, but every single adult had to pass a gun test or whatever. Mm hmm. So even they had a guy on the show that was blind, I think it was, Mm -hmm. that was talking about passing his gun test. Yeah, he showed him shooting at the target. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. No, but that's like, that's serious. That's really how it is in some of the states. I'm sorry, but not to be prejudiced against blind people, but I don't want someone that can't see a fucking thing. Shooting a gun, unless they're at a gun range. Not being against blind people. I'm not even at a gun range. Prejudiced. Why are you at a gun it's range? It's not safe. Well, it's fine if you've Period. got a thing that like beeps to tell them where the friggin' thing is, and someone's pointing them in the right direction. Fine, but other than that, no. Take up karate no. or something. Do something with your body that you can eat. Like what do you shoot guns for? Stupid. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Or like in Nevada, you don't have to. You don't have to say that you have a gun. Like you can just have the gun. Wow, and that's how it is there. I don't. Well, I know. Why? I know the the laws Why? have changed. What, what's the benefit? Yeah, <laughs> the laws have changed. It seems in Arizona, but when I was there the first time, that was in 2017, though. Okay, because when I was in Arizona the first time, if you had a pub or a restaurant that served alcohol, you either had to have a gun locker on site or allow someone to bring their handgun or whatever into the restaurant. Get or drunk, pub. shoot shoot up the place. Yeah. Let's take shots. Literally. And I mean... <laughs> shots. Shots. Ah, they got it. I shot, got what you're shot, putting shot, down. Shots. 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 That's a terrible song. Everybody. Oh, God. Remix. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. All right. Mm-hmm. So please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. Mm-hmm. Check us out at brewcrime.com, at brewcrime on Twitter, you can email us at brewcrime at pacificbeerchat.com. Mm-hmm. And as promised, I have finally started a Facebook group for Brew Crime. Oh, nice. About 10 minutes ago. Awesome. <laughs> so. I look forward to checking it out and yeah. uh, sharing it online. Yes. Cool. So feel free to leave us any messages or whatever. And please share this with all of your friends. Mm-hmm. Or enemies, whatever. We're yeah, not, everyone. Co workers, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> Especially this episode. Yeah. yeah. Assholes. Yeah. If you don't share this with your co workers, mm-hmm. watch out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Okay. Brew Crimes intro was created using Creative Commons attribution licensed audio from purple planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. This has been a production of pacificbeerchat.com. Brew Crime is part of the Hopped Up Network. Here is a sample of one of the podcasts you can check out 
by going to hoppedupnetwork.com. Hi, I'm Katie. And I'm Kathy. And we are Women Drinking Beer. We drink beer, review them, and tell you about them so you can approach a beer list with confidence. As part of the Hopped Up Network, we cover the Twin Cities beer scene along with other favorites as well as interviews with women in the beer industry. We upload weekly to iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. We can be found drinking beer daily on social media via Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search Women Drinking Beer and look for the kiss mark on the bottle cap. So if you enjoy beer or nerdy gals or both, we encourage you to taste along with us and come have a beer with us. Come have a beer with us. Now here is a promo from a fellow true crime or spooky podcast that we really enjoy. Hope you'll take a listen. Hi there, I'm Logan. And I'm Lindsay. And we host the new podcast, Folklore on the Rocks, where we talk about folklore and lesser-known creatures, cryptids, and monsters from around the world. When we say lesser-known, we mainly mean that we won't be covering creatures like Bigfoot or Nessie or Chupacabra, just because they're discussed so often, and the world just has so many other awesome options to draw from. Every two weeks, we'll be diving deep into the legends and culture that surround a specific creature, and getting a bit tipsy as we do so. But don't worry. We do our research sober. On <laughs> the weeks in between, we'll be narrating and discussing folk tales. So some will be historical folklore from the regions that our creatures are from, and some will be more like modern folklore, like no sleeps and creepy pastas. You can find out more about us on our website, folkloreontherocks.com, on Facebook and Instagram at Folklore on the Rocks, and Twitter at, at Folklore Rocks. So come on, grab a drink, join us, and let's dig deep together. 